Hello everyone, I am Amy Stones and I'm really excited to share this opportunity to introduce you to Kim McInnes. And she is an artist, she is so talented and knows how to work with so many different materials and has since um, become a curator and is also one of the founders and the artistic director of For All Handkind. And so she is here to share all about her practice and what she's up to. So here you go, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Amy. That was a really lovely introduction. <laughs> I would love for you to share just a little introduction about yourself and what sort of has kept you going as an artist and tell us about your inspiration and maybe if other artists have kind of brought you into the folds of feeling more um, confidence or um, familiarity with the idea of being an artist, but you know, it hasn't just been a couple years. You've been practicing art for over 15 years, right? So share with us what's kept you going um, throughout this time. And also, why do you choose to work with artists um, in the other ways that you work with artists? Wow, that's such a complex question. So yeah, um, I went to school at Cal State Fullerton in Southern California. That's where I actually where I met you, Amy, and I, or actually, originally, you might not know this about me, I was a 2D design major, and I actually transferred from um, Cal State Fresno. Um, my family was living up there, and then I came down to Southern California because I needed something new, and um, be even before that, I had been dabbling um, in all different kinds of art classes in community college, and so I think for me, I always knew that I wanted to be an artist since I was a little kid, but um, what that meant, um, I didn't really fully come to realize until um, I was an adult, and I'll touch on that again later, but I always liked to draw. Um, I was super crafty, and I think when I got to community college, I was so excited just to do everything. I did sewing, I took guitar lessons, um, I did watercolor, I did painting. Yeah, I, it was ridiculous. It was good that I was in community college because it was, you know, <laughs> would have been so expensive to do that at a regular university, right? Um, so when I finally uh, found glass blowing, um, it was like this magical material that it was al almost like, ma um, like magic happening right before your eyes, right? Or the closest to real life magic that I've ever encountered. And in instantly I just knew like, wow, I wanna learn how to do that. And so I think for me, um, what kept me um, wanting to, um, to make art was finding a medium that I was truly passionate about and also it was really difficult. And so um, for those of you who um, who might not know glass making or glass blowing rather, um, it's a really um, physical process and it involves, at least in the, the style that we learned, Amy and I learned, is called the Venetian offhand style. You work with a partner and it takes a lot of, um, physicality, coordination. It's almost like learning dance. You learn all the steps um, and you practice them over and over and over. And um, I remember thinking like, uh, as soon as I can make a good cup, like I'll be satisfied. <laughs> I'm in a quick glass blowing <laughs> because it's so it's so time in, in, um, intensive and it's, it's kind of expensive to blow glass too. Um, Amy knows that firsthand, right? Um, but I think the more I learned, the more I was like excited to learn more and really push my skills. And so I think really finding a, a medium that I was super passionate about, but also that like kind of challenged me to always want to be better and do better. And, um, and it was something I wasn't really like naturally inclined um, to. I know a lot of people that are, they play sports or maybe they're dancers or um, they just, for whatever reason, they have this like natural ability and they're super gifted glass blowers within like two years of making. And I think maybe if that was me, I probably would have given up within four years. So it was so, sort of that strive to like be better at something that was super challenging. And then also being around um, other um, amazing artists that had, had, amazing technical skill was also super inspiring. So that's sort of a, a long answer to that first question of, um, of I guess, what kept me making art. But um, to be honest with you, I, 
um, my own art practice, I keep separate or I consider separate than my glass making. And so I have a production line. It's just a few kind of kitschy items. And I use that um, term purposefully, kitsch, um, because I, I think that kitsch is something fun that people connect to, people that are sort of outside the art world. Um, and I acknowledge that um, what I make as a crafter isn't the same and not saying one is um, better than the other but what I make as a conceptual artist and so um, when I was in school while I was um, studying glass and Amy was there too we were um, encouraged to learn the tradition of glass blowing or the skill of glass blowing to make vessels but we were also um, discouraged from making production and instead encouraged to explore um, the conceptual na nature of contemporary art because that's sort of where we're at in the in the art world is people are um, using art I think in a as a visual language or um, and as a visual vocabulary to explore um, concepts that um, are important to them wouldn't you agree Amy definitely and I think I can see too, you know, being on the other side now and having taught at several different institutions, um, how there is a greater conversation about, are we making like handcrafted items? Um, are we making conceptual art? And I think that definitely, I can see knowing you in your curatorial practice, how you're really aware of that conversation and you bring that into the fold. Do you want to share with us, Kim, about working with other artists and how you kind of got from where you were as an artist yourself into curating and uh, now owning a shop? Sure. Um, so again, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit uh, kind of a multifaceted answer. But so while I was an undergrad, i um, not sure if you remember this or not, Amy, but I got a job as a student um, gallery assistant. So at Cal State Fullerton, there is a professional art gallery where they host um, two um, very large shows a year. There's full budgets. And so I was working as a gallery assistant um, for the preparator and I would help hang the artwork, prepare the gallery um, by doing all sorts of things like unpacking art, patching the walls. And so um, all while I was doing this, I was in undergrad, still blowing glass, still trying to perfect or <laughs> there's never perfection, right? But improving your glass blowing abilities, right? Uh, making conceptual art. And um, I had a little bit of a, a window into the graduate studies program um, of exhibition design at the school. And so uh, in my opinion, it was a really great program because um, they partnered up two graduate students and the two of them um, together would um, curate a show together um, that would be up in the gallery for, I think it's three months. So they probably have four major shows a year, but they also gave you a budget. And so for me, I saw this as a great way to um, not only get sort of a vocational MFA, but to kind of keep blowing glass. So for those of you who don't know it, there's not too many universities across the United States that offer um, glass blowing or even have glass blowing facilities. So I would say, what, 20 maybe, Amy? What do you think? Yeah, she's nodding yes. <laughs> okay, so I was really excited because not only, um, and here's the other thing about working in a gallery is that you're exposed to so many different kinds of art. You get to see 2D and 3D. Of course, that means you're seeing sculpture, printmaking, and it really kind of, um, there, was a, there was also a jewelry show while I was there. So it really kind of helped me not to sort of get um, um, tunnel vision and, um, and kind of just um, open up my eyes to things outside the glass world because I spent most of my time like kind of in and around the hot shop, of course. Um, uh, trying to learn how to blow glass. So um, that's what took me into curatorial studies. While I was there, um, I co-curated a show um, on uh, art and social practice, relational aesthetics with the, my friend and colleague, Cassandra Erb, who now works for the Lu Louisiana State Museum as an exhibition um, designer. And um, it was great. It was all about participatory art. Um, we learned a lot. Um, of course, we had a budget. Um, we did, we had real hands-on experience putting on um, an exhibition um, of a very large scale, working with uh, world-renowned artists such as um, Fallen Fruit, which is an awesome um, sort of activist performance art group. Um, Stephanie Sajuko, who now teaches at 
um, Cal Berkeley was there, um, or her artwork was there rather, Christy Roberts Berkowitz, who's an awesome LA artist, you guys should check her out, um, and many, many more. Um, we even had a couple um, pieces that were a nod to sort of the roots of relational aesthetics. Um, Tom Marioni's um, Drinking Beer with Friends is the Highest Form of Art. Um, I remember, Amy, you gave me a book of his when I was um, just a budding little undergrad. Um, and then we had a piece by <laughs> Abramovic and Ule, a video piece that was shown, and we made a Fluxus ping pong table. So anyway, fast forward, after grad school, I worked with I, uh, another colleague, Heather Bowling, who's now the uh, director at the Brea, City of Brea Art Gallery. And at that time, we were both uh, gallery um, assistants in the Brea Art Gallery. And we just started curating shows all over town. We had um, a little curatorial group called Day Job Projects. And I had a studio at Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana as a grad student. Um, and we would curate shows inside uh, my studio because <laughs> it was right, as you know, Amy, on the, on the walk. And you could see... Um, directly into the studio, um, which was awesome. And we had a, sh a couple different shows there. Um, one was one of my favorite artists, Casey Kaufman. She goes by the Instagram handle at Uncanny SF Valley. You can find all of her digital artwork there. Notice how I'm like promoting all my favorite artists. Yeah, go check them out. <laughs> and um, we had a show, we had a couple shows, um, more than a couple um, at a, even a tattoo shop in Laguna Beach for the, the Arts Walk. I'm doing all these shows on campus at Cal State Fullerton. We did one in Long Beach at um, Community Arts Center, Laguna Beach, um, Santa Ana, as I mentioned before. We actually won a contest um, through the city of Irvine and we got to curate a show at the Irvine Fine Arts Center um, called History Repaints Itself. So um, it was a lot of fun. I was super, um, energized and excited to just um, kind of do things with elbow grease but I needed a break so I went to Japan for the summer and I was kind of missing my glass community so I applied for a internship in Norfolk Virginia which is where I got to um, where I am today <laughs> and um, as far as what I'm working on right now that's um, it's directly related to my experience at the Chrysler Museum of Art Glass Studio um, so I participated in a six month uh, residency, artist residency is what they call it, but it was more of a, I mean, they do call it professional development, but it was more of an in, unpaid internship um, paired with professional development. Um, but at that time I, I got to work in glass again, which was super important to me. Um, and I met a lot of great artists that were local. And I started to realize that um, being in this facility that was itself only six years old at the time, um, and kind of seeing behind the scenes of how everything had recently been started and sort of what my ex and kind of matching or thinking about my expectations and, and matching that up or comparing it with reality. Once I got there, I sort of started realizing that, um, that I could do something not, maybe not as grand as, you know, what they were doing there, but I definitely had skills that were valuable and I had experience from, um, school and there were people around me that were totally um, talented and totally qualified um, people that knew graphic design people that could do photography and so basically I, I uh, presented the other artists around me um, specifically Gail Foreman who's another glass artist who now works for Urban Glass in New York and Kelsey McNair who also um, lives in New York now works for Re Renegade Craft Fair um, that we should make our own, um, I guess, collective, if you will, and we should sell our own products and, you know, make something ourselves because we had everything that, you know, it took. That's really awesome, Kim, to hear you describe just how one experience led to another experience to another and another. And what I think you're talking about in the end is how all of these previous, previous experiences gave you agency and this confidence that you didn't need permission from someone else to go ahead and do something that you just were like, I'm ready to do it. And you chose to do it. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've created since you made that decision um, and where you are today? Sure. So first I want to say that I never, ever felt like I was ready, but I did feel like I had the right friends. 
I think uh, after maybe 15, 13, 15 years of blowing glass, I kind of like, finally like tell people, oh, I'm a glass blower. But I do know that feeling of like not wanting to say like, I'm an artist or like not feeling confidence in like your own skills. And I think that's like something I hear not only from young artists who are my students or um, even artists that are my peers still to this day. And I remember having a conversation like even last year um, where, you know, one of my friends, because we all like kind of need that check in once in a while, right, where they said, you know, lately I've been thinking maybe I should have been a writer or maybe I should have you know, instead of an artist, or maybe I'm, I'm this, or maybe I'm that. And I just looked at her and said, that never goes away. <laughs> right, Amy? <laughs> We're always going to have those doubts, right? We're all like, am I making the right choice here? Right. But I think sometimes you just got to ignore them and push through, right? <laughs> well, and I mean, like, I think that's one reason why I've started this whole project of Live, Unite, and Inspire is that idea that by engaging with our peers or our colleagues or friends who are artists, there's more permission granted to continue to go further and explore new content and make new work as an artist, but also that idea that we're all in the same boat. Like we all want to make something and sell something or show something um, in a gallery or in a shop and, um, when we come together there's energy that's exchanged between us in these ideas and conversations but then that can be transformed into something greater which is why i'm really excited that you have done so much with your shop and um are representing like these amazing artists and um you know standing up for the quality of their work and their ideas so um i'll stop talking and you can share more. <laughs> so thanks amy so on to the shop. So me and or myself and Kelsey and Gail um, decided that we wanted to create a platform for artists um, who maybe were just like us. Um, as um, contemporary art makers, we also had sort of like a crafty thing on the side and we're always trying to like slang some goods, right? So we're like, okay, how do we, how do we make our uh, own um, online gallery um, for our stuff, even though we don't have a full line of anything, right? And so the idea was always that we would take all of our talents and um, instead of, of us all trying to do our own thing, we would bring them together and then we would have enough to make a full online gallery. And so that's where we started. We had a, a website through Squarespace and then we launched on um, December 8th, 2016. So um, of course, it was hard and of course I think online shopping is even harder than retail because um, unless people know who you are or you're doing the right advertising um, I don't know it's just all I think it all just depends on on where you start and um, I think for us too because we make glass it's it's more of a tactile experience and selling in person has just always been more beneficial for us so we went from um, doing little pop-ups and um, the museum actually hosted a couple events for us, which was really awesome. Um, and then they sort of kicked us out on um, and, and out of the nest and told us to, you know, um, fly free. So a local uh, uh, um, community organization called um, Downtown Norfolk Council started a project called Selden Market, which is amazing. And they renovated this whole um, arcade, like a former building that had been um, for artists at one point, but kind of abandoned because it suffered a fire. I think that was the history of it um, for um, new and sort of emerging businesses. And so, um, and they, it was all kind of subsidized by the city. So we were like, great. And um, we applied and we didn't get a storefront and we were super bummed. <laughs> Um, but we decided to do the pop-up situation. So we did that, um, which was great. We did it for a little bit for Christmas um, and still doing pop-ups all around the city. Um, but finally, our big break was when we applied for a contest at the local mall called uh, Battle of the Pop-Up and we won. So we won four months of free rent um, and it was originally supposed to be a kiosk. Um, and we proposed a, not only a, um, a gift shop, if you will, or a little retail shop, but um, workshops, hands-on workshops. And I think that's really what the mall was looking for. At the time, they're looking for um, experiential um, 
based um, businesses and or just things to do, things that were new and innovative. And so um, they were so excited about our concept and they were so impressed <laughs> by our branding, which is um, thanks to Kelsey McNair and also our, um, the woman who did our logo that um, they actually gave us a whole uh, retail storefront, which which was just about 900 square feet. And so then it was sort of like, okay, <laughs> thrown into the deep end, right? <laughs> but it was great. Um, we had a lot of um, really important press um, for our opening. And um, since then, we have about 60 local artists. We have, I would say, 20 that are not local. We have some from California. We have some from Pennsylvania, let's see, all over the country, New York, of course, um, some, uh, I think Tennessee. So yeah, um, we are holding strong um, through coronavirus, but um, we are now currently thinking of the best way we can pivot um, because as you know, the economy is changing. I would love to just um, share some, we'll share all the links that you've been talking about. And I think, you know, if you, now that, you know, it's been 13 or 15 years and you've had all this wide range of experience, is there anything that you would tell the younger version of yourself about um, how to keep moving forward or maybe even the current day version of yourself or of a colleague maybe who, you know, we all have these ups and downs as artists. So what are, what would you tell someone who's like maybe in one of those lower periods that will, you know, help get them motivated back up on the upswing? I would definitely say one thing that I know that I'm much better at, um, that I was terrible at as a young artist is um, probably talking to people and networking, but it's so important. You have to talk to people. Just get out there, introduce yourself. Um, and the best way to do that is go see art, go see all the art you can. And that was something I was really good at. I was going to all the shows, um, seeing what was out there. And I think, I think that is super important just to know what people are making and, um, just sort of building this kind of catalog in your brain, um, of art that you can reference. And okay. I, I thought of it. Here it is. The one thing I would tell myself as a young artist is <laughs> just because somebody else made something doesn't mean you can make it because you're never, ever going to make it the same way, right? It's never going to look the same, even if you want it to, right? I'm not talking about ripping off ideas, right? But if you're inspired and you come up with an idea, but then someone says, you know, oh, that's already been done or you can't do that. This artist is doing it. Just do it, but do it your own way. Thank you so much, Kim, um, for your time and really inspiration to share as an artist your experience and as a maker and a curator and a seer um, what's happening in your world. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Amy. Thank you. Bye, everyone.